So I'd like to start this panel by really continuing on, on, uh, on Ruth's talk, which is throughout the last two days we talk about the challenges of the interaction between technology, culture, and society. And Ruth focus on the role of academia in addressing this. So I'd like to go and get the other panelists thinking about what dealing with these big societal challenges. What is the, is academia part of the problem? Mm. And can, can, can academia be, be part of the solution? Diana. Um, yeah, I'd love to, to speak to that because it's something that I've thought a lot about. Um, the, the problem is that academics are not able to work on whatever they want. Speak to the mic, it. speak to the mic. Academics are not able to do whatever they want if they wish to remain employed in academia. And one of the things that I discovered when I began doing research on gender in economics um, and was told that this wasn't economics <clears throat> by my colleagues here at Rice, I, I realized that this wasn't just a problem for me it was at Rice, it was a problem everywhere because the field had essentially defined itself to rule out certain types of questions. And that, um, you know, for me, what I d did is I um, founded a new academic journal, Feminist Economics, which I'm pleased to say has now been um, successful, um, won a prize. We've been publishing now for over 25 years but it made it possible for other scholars to begin to do research in this area and use those articles to um, get tenure in their own departments and be able to do research in this area and to essentially reclaim the field. But it was a really difficult um, path to take. And to be honest, I don't think I could have done it if I didn't have, ironically, the support of my husband who you know, could support our family were I to lose my job, which I almost did. Um, and, and so I, I would just say that until we begin to really look at the power hierarchies in economic, I mean, in, in academia more generally, it's not possible. And in many fields, um, there's a lot of sort of incestuousness. Um, you know, one of the things that happens, again, this is in economics, is that, the peop is that there's a lot of... Um, um, people who go to, who've been to certain uni universities um, tend to be the ones who are hired there, who are published there. And, you know, I benefited, um, like you, from an elite education, um, which I think helped me. B but there are many people with valuable things to say who um, did not have those opportunities. And, and so it, it is a real challenge for academia. Anyway, I won't say any more. I've spoken a lot. If I may respond, uh, Diana, those are all uh, very true uh, points. And um, so I think that one of the things that the academy needs to change is just the incentive structure itself, um, which brings us to the whole tenure process and how tenure is uh, reviewed and how it's granted, um, what we consider to be uh, good research and what we consider to be good academic outcomes. I mean, if you look at all of those requirements, I mean, it's, it's pretty outdated. I think that the, that the tenure process itself needs to be updated and we need to value more than publications and citations, and please don't misunderstand me, everyone, that I, I'm not saying that all those things are a waste of time. I just think that's just the beginning, right? We should value and measure research impact if, if we're really interested in, interested in having an impact on our society. But that's hard. Yes, that's very hard to do, and, but we, I think we can do it. So, Alex, we're talking about the role of academia. I'm sorry, I was, I know, was yeah. out of the room. <laughs> we are talking about the role of academia in this, in this uh, uh, interaction of technology, culture, and society, and whether academia is, is part of the problem, and can it be part of the solution. In some sense, what Ruth told us about how academia can be part of the solution, but, but it has to change in order to be part of the solution. 
Anybody else would like to comment? Rick? Well, one of the nice features about Rice is that we get to teach pretty smart students who we can reach out to. Um, I wish you'd, I wish I'd consulted with you, Ruth, on my research design class that's mandatory for our majors. And yet, everything you said was exactly the steps that we had um, in that class. And so the goal is to teach them to think independently, to use the tools at their disposal, and to think creatively about how to carry out research. And this is a class where they have to do it on themselves for their very first time. And so you have an enormous amount of leverage on getting students to um, apply social science skills, uh, to, to think broadly, maybe to do what Rodrigo is talking about in terms of getting them to think more generally about the bigger, bigger questions as well, as they're struggling and grappling with, oh my God, I gotta do measurement, I gotta do statistics, I have to, oh, I gotta plan out how I'm gonna treat subjects or you know whatever they're doing. And so maybe there's some value in the fact that we actually get to teach once in a while. And you know, that ought to be reflected probably in tenure. <laughs> so. I mean, other thing I was struck by, by, by this slide is how much rice does not do it. Where are we? What is the end goal? How do we get there? Exactly the stages that you do it. I've never had a serious conversation at Rice about, okay, where are we? Where do we want to go? How do we go there? Just, it's not something we talk about. It's very striking. Anybody else would like to comment? I yeah. Think I just want to say that, instead of that, the, um, the military stuff that you went through. And I think it's all slightly truer and maybe more painful, but it's slightly painful the way some of these responded. Um, independent of what they were. I mean, you know, you, you two, for instance, all have these papers. Didn't they did I can say a couple of words. I, <clears throat> maybe because I come from a historian's family, I, I sometimes get lured into history projects. And at one point, I was uh, studying the history of the university. Oh, sir. Okay. And um, it's interesting that um, you know, historically, the university comes from a, the Latin term universitas, and it refers to a contract form, a generic contract form that students and teachers would sign with each other for the purposes of learning. And that's like the, the university at its heart is that relationship of learning, I think. And everything that's come afterwards, we built whole cities on this basis. You know, Rice is basically a city unto itself. It's got its own energy system, its own water system. In a lot of ways, it's taken, taken on so many different functions. Yeah, it's come in handy a couple of times, right? Um, but I think that when we think about the space of learning, uh, it's also a space of possibility and transformation at the same time, too. I'll recommend a book which I think is the most honest and inspiring book about academic life that I've read in a long time. It's a book called The Undercommons by uh, Fred Moten and Stefan O'Harney that describes both an honest assessment with how overly bureaucratized and professionalized higher education has become at the same time that takes seriously. It's a space of refuge. It's one of the few bases of refuge for thinking differently within the society where people can kind of maintain uh, brushing against the grain of, of kind of common sense. And that's really, really valuable. Um, to link it back to the themes of our morning panel, uh, we know that universities have taken a role in divestment from fossil fuels. Not many of them, but enough that it's created kind of a symbolic wave that reminds me when I was growing up of the divestment movement from South Africa, which was also speared by a lot of um, universities, creating moral pressure, or public pressure uh, on governments to act. And I think we have that function too. Not that I'm expecting Rice is gonna go that road anytime soon, but I think it's something that we should be considering because I think you know another thing about our history is looking ahead and imagining how 60 years from now, people might look back on what we're doing now. Um, and if there was a task force 60 years from now, 
looking at you know entanglements rice has that it's not being very honest about i would say it's entanglements with the fossil fuel industry will be something that eventually we will be called uh, to investigate more deeply than we are today you'll be a task force one day they they won't need a task force for that it'll mm -hmm. be pretty clear <laughs> I, I'd like to second uh, Dominic's recommendation on the undercommons. Um, for me, that has been very inspirational work. And it also speaks to, to one particular issue that I've encountered in academia, which is that, for instance, uh, one of the authors precisely of this book, Fred Moten, is also a poet. Right? And, and he's able to speak across different discourses and modes of communication. And, and to me, that's, that's very important um, as in what I try to teach students but I also see it as a constant challenge here in academia, right? Where the disciplinary boundaries, if you know, they want to serve the purpose or have this very kind of practical function in mind, but end up becoming a barrier. End up becoming a barrier for collaboration between researchers and professors and for the students, right? That from the moment that they're 18 years old, they have to choose a major, right? And then it becomes this kind of complicated bureaucratic process because then it's okay, it's a major with a specialization, but then I have the opportunity of a minor. And instead of them thinking about how they can bring together these different kind of intellectual tradition or modes of thinking, it becomes about accumulating honors and badges. Right? And even for instance, then from this very young age, they start making these decisions, not only in so far as what they're going to major in, but in so far of how they're gonna think about the world, right? So in, te in teaching computer science, I'm, I encounter a lot of students that are into computational thinking. Okay, right? So let me introduce you to some critical thinking then, right? And how that's different, right? But it's already, I find, a kind of attitude of entrenchment of like, no, this is the way that we do things here within this discipline, and this is the way that I like to think about things. And well, that of course leads to solutionism. Right? Well, we're not looking at the underlying problems. We're just trying to come up with immediate practical solutions that do nothing from our long-term perspective. So again, for me here, you know, disciplinarity is also a big challenge. And I think that one that being here in this panel, precisely from different disciplines, it's very important for us to think about and work together to try to overcome. So, so there is a debate kind of going on these days about the, 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 the mission of the university. And it kind of split between the, the pure knowledge, just seeking knowledge. University is about seeking knowledge and transmitting it. That's one view. And then the people who say, no, it's about, about social justice. And my own view is that uh, both camps got it wrong. That the mission of the university is not social justice per se. The mission of the university is we can go into the public, the public good or the common good or social good, but basically what I would call the betterment of society, which is in fact in, in a betterment of the world is part of Rice's mission. Now, I don't think there is a unique path to the betterment of society or, or the betterment of the world. So I've engaged in partnership research exactly like you described, but that research was built on a hundred years of academic research. The people who just, just pursued topics, foundation of mathematics, just, just really pure ideas, and they publish papers that very few people read. But that research has enabled me to do partnership research and take it all the way to industry. So there's no direct path, I think. I think, yes, I think mission of the university is to contribute to the betterment of the world, but there are many, many paths to do it. As long as we remember, this is the ultimate goal. Even if you're doing pure research, that's for other academics, the, the real goal in the long term is betterment of the world. Moshe, thanks for bringing up that, uh, that debate. I've uh, been uh, approached about that as well, about, you, well, where does basic research fit in, in terms of everything that I just described. And I would say I agree with you uh, about the need for both. Um, I definitely think that uh, basic research plays a very important role. However, my argument is that um, I feel that we have not done enough of the other kind of research, yeah. um, and that's why I am making a push for that. And I also think that the academy has not done enough to uh, promote and, um, and incentivize that kind of research. And that's the part that is really uh, problematic in my view. 
Anna? Uh, I'd like to raise something uh, that uh, I hope is not tangential, but is to this issue of making the world a better place and the role of technology and so forth. And that is the um, effective altruism movement, which some of you may have seen that the um, president of FTX was involved with, which was essentially, it's, it's almost like the opposite of doing research. It's the idea that if, instead of becoming a scholar, go and make a whole lot of money and then use your money to <clears throat> be a philanthropist, the problem is that you then have to have a good plan for what to do with all that money and it can bypass democratic institutions and ways of finding out what you know you know whose voices should matter in deciding how to improve things you know it topics that academics actually do have something to say about even however flawed they may be and so i mean i do think that there are a lot of really very interesting questions about what is the best way to move forward in b both in the academy but also in thinking about people's roles outside the academy in trying to uh, help improve the world and you know thinking about you know uses of technology and so doing hey Pui Pui, this university of indiana i don't remember exactly the the there is a Indiana is the university, and they have a school of philanthropy. And I once attended a conference there, and the joke was that the, the PhD students don't get stipends. They have to raise their own money. <laughs> I want to open it for people in the, yeah, in the yeah. audience. I just want to ask... Uh, speak to the mic. Speak to the mic. Hello. Can yes. you... Yeah. Uh, you did a lot of research, apparently, with HISD. So why is the state of Texas uh, threatening to take over? Uh, I've been hearing some reports. Any comments on that, please? Oh, I, was, I was dying to ask this question. <laughs> sure, yes. Uh, HISD uh, has had several huge challenges, including for quite a while they had a very, and I think it's, a, it's okay for me to use this word, a very dysfunctional board. Um, and, <laughs> and they also um, faced uh, some, uh, they had low test scores. Uh, for uh, over a period of several years, and that's why, so for both of those reasons, uh, that's why TEA um, threatened to take over uh, the, the school district. Um, however, TEA isn't really set up to do that, so I, I don't think that that, well, I don't, I don't want to be quoted on this, but <laughs> I think that's unlikely to happen given that TEA doesn't really have the capacity uh, to do that. Having said that, um, the district has been working to, to make some significant changes to address those two concerns that I mentioned. And uh, so I do think the board is, is more functional now than, than some years ago. And then, of course, they have new leadership. They um, have a relatively new, I guess not quite so new, uh, Superintendent Millard House, um, who I think has been doing a pretty good job of, of Are leading. Them? Are they all what? Am I helping them? I would say uh, my team is definitely working with them. In fact, um, our research was, was used extensively uh, in the development of HISD's strategic plan. They had not done one in many years, uh, and when their new superintendent arrived, uh, they uh, met with my team, uh, I'm not exaggerating, for hours and hours multiple times. Um, so they, they, they used our research extensively for that. Um, so they are definitely making an effort. Thank you. Aditya? Um, we talked about different topics over the past couple of days, like health reform, climate change, big tech, and so on. And of course, a common theme that sort of emerged was bad governance is, a, is one of the dead ends in all these aspects. Like lobbying and oil and gas industry lobbying and big pharma lobbying and um, big tech and of course you know like these are this is known for forever now and a hard problem but i was wondering if there is something that academia can do about it i mean especially considering that right now seems to be a very uh, we seem to be on the cusp economically like uh, in terms of there being a big recession, 
um, lots of upheavals, change in um, capital being shifted towards the top 1% and so on. So is there something that can be done in academia for that? Rick, you're the political scientist. Oh, great, thanks. You know, where do you draw the line at who gets to lobby? I mean, that seems to me to be a subjective decision that um, might not go well with all. I mean, do you, do you take public interest groups and say you shouldn't be lobbying? Do you take, you know, cigarette tobacco lobbyings and say you can't? I mean, it's, it's a difficult decision. Now, what can academics do? I think what we can do better and I've heard a lot of that on this panel, is, is to provide kind of translational knowledge to the level of mm, probably not members of Congress. Um, I've had much more luck at dealing with staffers. Uh, you can explain what you do, you can explain the problems, you can explain the set of solutions, and you can get their ear in the way that you're not going to get the ear of a senior member of Congress or a state legislator or, you know, you name the level at which you want to work. But you better have um, a, a really good story to tell about your research. It's, it's translational. It's, it's, it, it is not what we're trained to do. <laughs> you know that. And if, if we can develop that a little better, I mean, Dan, you, you do it all the time in the books that you write. I mean, you're doing fundamental translational research that's at, it's not dumbed down science. It's, you know, it, it's a way of explaining maybe storytelling um, to people who are willing to listen or take the effort to read. And, and I think that's something that we could do a much better job in the academy, or at least I certainly could do a much better job of that. Um, and maybe that's that's the hope. That's how you offset, you know, tons of money being spent and not decide who gets to spend that money on what questions. Well, let me let me rephrase Adidas' question. If I look at today, say, better of the world, what are the biggest problem of the world right now? I see first and foremost the climate crisis. The second one is the democracy crisis. And and the third one is, I would say, the, the global world all order crisis, the world order that, we, that we was stable, kind of disintegrating in front of our eyes. And what are we doing about it? So, so at least we've heard we're doing, trying to do something. In the, in the last couple of years, I think that Dominique and Sylvia and other people have been involved in very strong sustainability movement initiative at RISE. Uh, we, we don't know much more to do about democracy and not much about uh, the, the world order. But these are my assessment, just, look, just looking, you know, I'm not a global, not, not a world expert, but these seem to me the three huge problems facing, facing society today. And we would think if we want to do better on the world, then we should try to think what can be done about it. We have some kind of an obligation, if our knowledge has to be relevant in some way to better on the world, we, we should ignore the biggest problem facing us right now. Sylvia. I just want to echo your comment and also say that a theme that underlies all three of those problems is misinformation. If you look at issues surrounding democracy and climate change and, you know, human health and many of the other themes we've talked about and, you know, we heard about social media and the role of the internet today as well, the fact that we have so many people in the world who are getting inaccurate information about these problems you know, climate change is a great example. There's been a deliberate and decades-long campaign to confuse the public about the science of climate change, and as a result, we're 50 years behind on a homework assignment that's 100 years overdue. <laughs> um, so, so I think it's worth pointing out that commonality. And misinformation and how we process information and what's fact and what's fiction is really a social sciences problem that you know, we're hitting a wall in science and engineering trying to understand why people don't want to accept COVID vaccines or why they don't believe, which is not a word you're allowed to say in science, in climate science. So that's, that's a common theme underlying all of these problems, which I, keeps me up at night. <laughs> well, 
this is the case where I think actually, speaking as a computer scientist, I think I feel guilty about it because we have missed, we thought information is good, right? So more information should be better and most information should be best. And we have missed the fact that people have limited capacity to process information. They're just saying, okay, there is more and more and more, people can process it. But actually, what people are trying to do now to say, okay, there's too much information, so I'm going to just watch Fox News. That's how I'm going to get my information. So, so partly, the, the, you know, we can blame uh, all kinds of things, but part of the reason people form cognitive, there are these cognitive bubbles, because people can process too much information. And uh, coming from the computer science, we completely miss the fact what will happen if there's just too much information. I, I do want to relate that, uh, if I may, to the issue of education and inequalities in education, which at some level, um, the vast majority of people who are misinformed are also not well educated. And, you know, a question is, you know, why are why in the U.S. is such a huge percentage of our population deprived of a good education? And a lot of that has to do with um, elites um, not providing adequate resources to schools and for themselves opting out of the, of the systems that um, you know, are not adequately supporting them and not viewing investment in education and quality education as a as a as a public good, and you know, and it you know can relate to the pay of school teachers, to uh, resources being available, and so forth. Because in a as a practical matter, the people who are well educated are much more able to resist conspiracy theories, and and so forth. But that you know relates to a political system which permits, you know, bad educations uh, to. You know, or, or you know, unequal access to um, a, a good education. So I do want to put in another comment about Wikipedia and the value of uh, continuing to think about that because the article on on climate change, you know, is one of the most contested articles, and yet you know, misinformation is not permitted to flourish on that page. And so, t to the extent that people are at least not discouraged from you know, or that more people will contribute to it and that this as a free resource can be made better, uh, which we can all um, play a role in. I think that that is, is one form of social action that a lot of people have access to. Who put, somebody put today a picture of the cover page of Eleanor Boston book to this. So, and I know the trick you have written about this, about the commons. And this is something we don't think enough. Wikipedia is an example, a successful example of the commons that people say, okay, how do we yeah. maintain this as a common? And Eleanor Bostrom gave us some guidelines. How do you maintain a common? Yeah. But not enough of this was all. When people saw the internet, they didn't realize they're building a common. But they didn't try to apply the principles. So what happened was that, uh, if you may remember, uh, some years ago, everybody was talking about peer-to-peer. What happened to peer-to-peer -peer was supposed to be this, you know, we will work it together. But what happened is the big guys came and basically took over. The internet today is controlled by a very small number of, corp of very large corporations. <coughs> so I think the fact is that we need to build the common is something that, we, that Wikipedia is one successful example of people from the very beginning who says, what are the ground rules to do that? And how do we, you know, it doesn't mean it's easy. You can continue to vigilance is required, but at least they came up with the idea. This is a common. We have to be vigilant how to maintain it as a common. And I think that it's a very particular kind of commons that we're talking about, right? Because we're talking about the commons of truth, if yeah. you will, right? Because there have always been commons, right? If we go back to medieval Europe, you know, yeah, that's yeah. in many ways what the concept refers to. But the truth was never a part of the commons, right? The, the truth was uh, within the parameters of the kings and priests. The project of the Enlightenment was precisely to shift that epistemic regime, right? To, to move truth towards, again, towards the people, right? These notions of democracy. And again, in my mind, this, this is a great example to look at precisely some of the failures of the Enlightenment project. 
in some of the failures of rationalism and of liberalism in terms of how we have failed to make that transition effectively and in many ways how it has been distorted, right? Because um, while liberalism valued certain principles, still such as honor and knowledge and cooperation and such, neoliberalism does not, no. right? And there it just becomes about the individual and about competition, right? And about, uh, you know, on political grounds, deregulation. So with that, well, you know, how can there be any kind of shared concept of truth, right? I, I think that it is the biggest task that the Enlightenment has had and the one that is in, in the highest degree of contestation at the moment. So recently I went back to read the Adam Smith and uh, which have uh, the invisible hand, which neoliberalism neo keeps citing, invisible hand. And when you read Adam Smith, he said, what is the goal? The goal is betterment of society. He doesn't say uh, the, rich get, the, the rich get richer. He said the goal is betterment of society. So, so I think, though, Moshe, it's in our interest to, to grapple with what folks meant when they said that, right? So... One of the things, what, who was in society and who was out of Ab society. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I think, and, and I think absolutely. one of the things yeah. that we've, we've brought up here or that we've made connections between is the relationship between um, how people treat the commons or how people treat infrastru infrastructure or disinvestment and the relationship between those things and who we think deserves good infrastructure or good air, um, et, et, et cetera. And, and, and so the relationship between an opening up of the society and um, a disinvestment in the things that we used to call public when our, when our idea of public was, what, was much smaller. So, so I think that's one of the real challenges. Can we, can we be committed to good water Right when all of a sudden we wait, we got to have good water in black neighborhoods too. Right? Yeah, and and so that's that's one thing. I think we've really got to struggle with the ways in which ideas about racial equality are moving a good amount of this disinvestment. And then just to bring it back to the university, right? So for for me, the greatest public good that I can think of is health. Right, and and so, um, I, 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 for most of my life, I didn't know I had asthma as a kid. Right, I just I would cut the yard and I would go into my house and I would lie down on the floor for like five six hours and feel like I was going to die, and I didn't die, but also didn't know I had asthma until I got old enough and rich enough to get treated, Di diagnosis, right, yeah. to get diagnosed. Uh, and, and so just to bring it back to the university, like, so how do we, I don't even know at a university that has an $8 billion in the bank, right? Do we, do we even, I'm, I'm being critical, I should, I'm going to say it in a different way. I'm going to say it in a better way. <laughs> so at a, at a society like better. Rice, oh my goodness. that, that is extra. <laughs> well, you, I learned from you. In, in our society, which is this university, which is committed to the care of undergraduates and faculty, right, is the, and, and the health of our students is fundamental to everything that we do. Um, are we doing enough, right, are, are, are we doing enough to maintain and guarantee, or could we do more to maintain and guarantee at a fundamental level the health of our students in a way that would teach them that this is a common good or would show them that this is a common good that, that, that may um, redound out into society as they, as, as they grow up? And that's just a way of saying, right, I don't even know their own students have enough access to good mental health care or good medical care. And we are literally across the street from the best health care, some of the best health care in the world. And so I, I would, if we could, I, I feel like we could decide to solve this problem at Rice yeah. in, in ways that wouldn't necessarily be selfish, that could redound, well, or that may look selfish, it may be a little bit selfish, <laughs> but, but, but that could redound 
um, to, to, toward the greater good. I would say I found myself in the last few years, even before the pandemic, to be really the, I think very often the, fir the first person the students go to, to say that they have some kind of a mental health issues, okay? And uh, I'm not particularly well trained for that. And I don't think my, my experience is unique. And I don't think that we have yet done the fact the faculty are the front line of dealing with students' uh, mental health issues. I don't think university has yet responded to it properly. I mean, this is an issue that all of us are facing, and I have not seen a coordinated university response to that. Well, and I, I just want to rush to say, because I'm still learning, that I think the university, like the folks who are doing this job, have done amazing, a, a great job. The difference between, I was a college magister once, the difference between mental health um, resources provided to students and college magisters when I became a college magister and when I was leaving as a college magister was night and day. Mm. But it's absolutely still not enough. Like I do, like why can we not guarantee for our students a first rate healthcare system? Why, why can we not do that for students at Rice? Why can we not build on our campus for our faculty, I mean, just go crazy for students, staff, and faculty, um, a first rate healthcare system. But again, if you. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm asking. Because I, I, I mean, maybe we don't, maybe someone would argue we don't have the resource. But I wish that was part of the will. Well, you know, I would say generally, if you look at our mission statement, it has. has Unsurpassed undergraduate education, and I think Rice does offer amazing undergraduate education. And outstanding research, and I think Rice does outstanding research. And betterment of the world. When do we talk, where do we, where and when do we talk about betterment of the world as a community? I mean, so Ruth talked about she ha how she has basically reoriented her research because she wants to do very direct. I said there are many paths to betterment of the world, but she decided on her path, and I think it's quite amazing. But this is not a conversation we're having on campus. In our mission statement, we're not talking about it. You know, we started now, she and Sha, we came up, we discussed it. We said the mission statement is a good place to start, and we're doing this uh, Betterment of the World uh, uh, she and Sha lecture series. We had two, and I'm looking forward to the coming. But it's the first time, I think, and this conference also, in some sense, about Betterment of the World, and it's the first coordinate activity that I'm seeing. We're dealing with something which is the core mission of the university is betterment of the world, and it's just not something we really talk about. Yes. Yeah, here, wait, wait for the mic. Wait, you sit, sit there, wait for the mic. The mic is coming. Mic is coming. I've been sitting here listening and thinking about this, and there are a few points that I think might be, at least I'd like to throw out. Uh, one is about education, and particularly here in Houston or the Houston area. You look at what's happening with private schools and those people who can afford to send, to take their kids out of the public mm -hmm. schools and go to a St. John's or wherever else it might be, they're doing that. And, you know, this is creating, it, you're creating two societies uh, in, in this. And it's not unique to Houston, but it, it's something that is fairly common, and I've had occasion over the last few years that around the table, we've had neighbors and whatever to ask how many of their kids go to the public schools and how many go to the private schools. And almost universally, they go to private schools if they can afford it. And what does that mean then in terms of the educational experience that the kids who, whose parents can't afford to send them to private school, what kind of an education are they getting? And it's not universally bad or anything like that, and the teachers are well-intended and so forth. But there are a lot of issues that flow from that, who the kids associate with, you know, so forth. So that's, that's one area that I've observed that I think is a huge problem, at least in the, this area. But I, in talking to people who live, friends who live elsewhere, it's not unique to Houston. So that, that's one thing. Another thing, I think I'm the only person who was here yesterday or today, who really has an energy industry background. So maybe I kind of recoil a little bit from what I, the impression that I get uh, from a lot of the comments about the energy industry. 
And I'm not here to say that the energy industry is great, that everybody is fine, all that. Obviously, like anything else, there are people who are well-intended, there are people who have other motivations and so forth. It's a mixed bag. But there is, a, I think, an issue with, again, it's sort of the same kind of outreach and how to understand each other. And there's a, I get kind of a feeling in listening to all this that we, we sort of have two sides to this. And there's kind of an antagonism or a belief uh, set of rightly or wrongly attitudes about the other side, you know, whether from industry, looking at the university, a university, not just necessarily Rice, uh, and, or Rice looking at uh, the industry. And the industry is many different things. You know, I mean, they're good companies. <laughs> I won't say they're bad companies, but there's some who I, I personally wouldn't hold such a high esteem, in such a high esteem. But they vary widely. I mean, even within a, a large corporation like an Exxon, uh, where I worked for 34 years, I mean, it's, it's vast, there are huge ranges. And uh, you know, it's hard to, you shouldn't paint pictures of them categorically as the same. But there is a need to reach out and to, to work. Uh, for example, I'm involved with a solar company here in Houston. And we desperately need good people to join the company. Fortunately, it's growing. Uh, but it's been hard. We've talked to the uh, people here at Rice, who are in, not in your areas, I guess, but in other parts, trying to attract some of the best and brightest to join the company because of what they could do, how they could help the, the company grow and uh, increase their capabilities and so forth. So I think, I guess my m message is we tend to throw stones is probably too strong a, a way to describe it, but we don't necessarily reach out and understand each other and talk to each other enough about some of these things. And it, it's, a, it's a shame that maybe that there aren't more people here from other areas to hear the kinds of things that you're talking about. By the same token, for you all and your counterparts yesterday or this morning to hear some of the other side. You know, it's finite how much time there is and how many different topics you can cover and so forth. But I really do think that there, there are opportunities to kind of bridge some of these gaps and perhaps misunderstandings and, and so forth and, and overall lead to a better result. I may respond to that. Oh, no, please, you go first. You haven't said. Um, yeah, I, I can understand that perspective seeing just what you see in these two days of the conference. But um, I think as the only uh, member of the School of Engineering here, if you come and see you know, our dean has made uh, energy transition and sustainability one of his top three areas that he wants the School of Engineering to be focused on. And he has an engineering advisory board with its own subset that is specifically from the energy industry try and industry energy industry writ large from from all spectrums of it trying to figure how as a school of engineering we get more into that area we're creating a new master's degree creating a lot of new initiatives in that space i also wear another hat as a um faculty fellow at the center for energy studies at the baker institute and at each of those events you have multiple events a month where uh, lots of players from all four forms of energy industry so i i understand the impression from today, but I think spanning across what Rice is doing, there's a lot we need to do better. I think there's, uh, it's big that um, that our new president, Reggie, has created a new position of a vice president of innovation, which we haven't had before. So looking at more translational, look at more, how does what we do uh, at Rice lead to to patents, to startups, to, to things that actually make a difference in the industry. There's more work in that direction. Our, our new vice president of research, Ramesh, you know, came from the Sunshot initiative. So I think um, there is a lot in that space. We are having served with, with some of the others up here on, on a task force that looked at what we need to do in terms of a environment institute or tying in energy, what, what that might be. We are alone among the top 25 universities in not having a school of environment or a school of climate or, or something that would bring us together in those ways. There's a lot that Rice needs to do better, but I think, um, but there is a lot more going in going in a variety of directions than, than might be uh, apparent in these two days. Columbia University launched an initiative called the Fourth Purpose, 
And I said that traditionally three kind of things that we do in the university is teaching, research, and service. Both professional, academic, do a lot of professional service, but also a lot of uh, so, so, you know, societal service, serving on, on various studies and things like that. And the fourth purpose that they put explicitly is translational research. You should take a look, just Google, Colombia, fourth purpose. And they said this has to be an explicit mission of the university to take the knowledge that they're building and translate it to the benefit of society. Can I, I just want to um, re respond to the first part of your, of your comment. And, and I think one of the, and you said around here when you were talking about schools, so I'm going to call that, um, were you referring to this neighborhood or around Rice, or you're just saying Houston? Okay. I, I, I think one of the, but I think the school thing is, is key, right? And, and I think one of the things we all need to ask each other, but I think um, white citizens of Houston and Texas need to ask each other more than anything else is what's behind, what's, what's behind the reticence to send their children to school with folks who are black and brown? Um, and, 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 and what's behind the, the, uh, the, the idea of good schools and, 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 and bad schools and the ways in which those terms are racialized? And I, and, and I think until white citizens really grapple with that, what it means to share a school building, then um, a lot of other questions around public goods and, and, and commons are going are gonna to remain terribly unresolved. All, in lots of different places, uh, and so I mean, she she has a pretty good window into this. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, but there's some of these trends that I don't think ultimately are beneficial to to society. Okay, Paige, and then we close. Yeah, give her the mic. Yeah. Um, thank you all for all you've shared um, today. Um, I guess as a member of Rice's undergraduate student population, um, there's a heavy emphasis on the culture of care. Um, you know, that means care for others. Um, and I also see it as students caring a lot about themselves, about their grades, about their test scores. Um, and I really like what uh, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Ferreira, um, about, you know, having that emphasis on compassion and care and ethics. Um, and I guess I see it as, you know, we, we don't just say, oh, this is an industry, like computer science, for example, or social science, like, oh, in this instance, I'm going to apply ethics that I learned somewhere um, to have a compassionate impact in this one instance. Um, I mean, personally, I see it as, you know, life is a classroom for us to learn how to be more compassionate, to care about each other. Um, and then, so that will naturally impact our decisions in whatever industry we're in. So I guess my question is, is there a way to, I guess, teach or further emphasize that to spread that um, em emphasis on compassion uh, for humanity and for the world? Um, I guess really in a non, a department specific instance. <laughs> Rodrigo, I think yes. you should have the last word. Yes, yes, yes. Well, ho hopefully not the last word, but um, just to say that uh, I, I very much appreciate your comment and I very much appreciate you sharing precisely that spirit, right? Because I do see that in students, right? I do see students precisely helping each other out and being interested. You know, my, my class is an elective, right? And these are students that are signing up because they want to learn about ethics, right? Some of them are signing up because they, have, they think that it's gonna be easier than other courses and then they're unpleasantly surprised, right? Um, but yes, th there is that care, right? And, and, and that, 
you know, at least as it refers to some of the topics that we've been talking about here, as it refers to health, as it refers to the environment, as it refers to the issues, the cultural issues around big tech, maybe in some ways that is new, right? May, may, maybe this growing concern, this, this radical increase that has taken place over the past few years is significant, right? So I very much appreciate you sharing this. And again, at, at least in, in the work that I hope to do in the classroom, here in the conference, and speaking with my colleagues, is that, yeah, you know, we, we want to share and we want to be able to talk about the underlying issues, um, as Ruth here put it, right? Trying to think about that ultimate consequence, the last instance, right? And, and thinking about how it is that beyond disciplinary boundaries, beyond research incentives or methods, ultimately it is in my mind about caring about each other, right? And again, that's, that's the message that, that I hope to get across and I think that in helping to organize this conference and in knowing Moshe's work, that that's exactly what we're going for as well. I think for those of us who don't teach in ethics or in topics that, that the culture of care or that side comes through, I think it's in some ways limited what we can do in the classroom. And one area of concern that I've had this year is, is there seems to be a, a culture shift that I used to be very involved that Will Rice is the college where I'm a, an associate I'm a divisional advisor there and would always go with the O-Week uh, group. And it used to be that there would be, you know, a dozen of us at least at any given lunch that are joining in at meals. And you sort of get to know each other beyond just what you talk about in the classroom, to know each other as people. I go back, you know, when I can to the O-Week group or see if there are any divisional advisees who want to meet with me. And and besides the, the magisters and the RAs, I see very very little of that happening. And so I don't know to what extent to what extent that helped before, but definitely if as students, if, if the sort of way that we had these these residential college communities and, and the associates program and so on, if that that I think kind of withered during during COVID when we weren't allowed to be in the colleges, um, if that came back, I think it it lets us see each other in places beyond just the classroom setting. Let's wrap up. So the purpose of the, the LAN conference is to, it's a biennial conference, well, when there's no pandemic, it's supposed to be every two years. It's a conference that's supposed to transcend traditional di disciplinary uh, boundaries and to really ask the, try to address some big questions, what I call life, the universe, and everything. And uh, I think if you attend these two days, which I was able to attend about half, uh, it exactly did that, it took like some of the biggest issues that society is facing and having amazing talks. I want to thank all the speakers and all the moderators and all of you for sitting and participating and asking such fantastic questions. I want to thank Adriana, who very quietly made sure that all of the log logistics work, and Anne, who's sitting outside, and together we had a fantastic logistic team. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next LAN conference. Yes, Margaret. Almost, 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 <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you all.